Behind the shade, morning is docked like an ocean liner. There's that moment after you open your eyes, just a few seconds, maybe less, before you put the world back together, before you know who you are. You're looking at a slice of light between the window frame and the shade. Then you take up your identity with its burden of memories and preconceptions, and it's the same day as yesterday. Now, though, I remember June and lie there listening to the birds and the BQE, getting used to the idea that life starts here. Philly comes in wearing a beanie, opens his locker, says, Harold, what's going to be? Harold's untying his, oh, Philly's untying his shoes. He's feeling expansive, talking about his date last night to an old man who's collapsed on a stool after a shower. Philly says, I took her to Cafe Riazor. I get the chicken. You ever had the chicken there? With a sad shrug, Harold says, I had the steak. It was wonderful. <laughs> I go for the chicken Riazor. If I was going to the electric chair, you know what I'd have for my last meal? Chicken Riazor. What about you? Unhappily, Harold says, I don't think I'd have much of an appetite. <laughs> when I got to the airport, I sent my stuff through the machine, phone and keys and coins, in the bin, right? But these new scanners, you can't have anything in your pockets, metal or not. So I had to step out and send my wallet through, try again. TSA woman says, what's in your back pocket? I reach for my bandana, pull out a pair of panties. <laughs> Black lace panties with a little white pearl attached. Which I then have to hold above my head in the glass cylinder like I'm under the mistletoe until the scanner goes around. You got a problem with that? <laughs> Pale sky over the red lobster. David Loy's older brother had a big, dirty silver Pontiac with a red velour interior. One evening we got in, Dave and Alex and I, and went driving around in a dusk of this same muffled light. I found a fifth of Seagram's under the seat and got loaded. In a carnival tent, they accused us of being pickpockets and threw us out, but not without a fight. The year for me is a continual recycling of micro seasons and weathers and specificities of light I experienced before I was 20. We're on the top deck of the Fire Island Ferry, June and I. As the boat picks up speed and the foam peels off the hull, we're reading a paper someone left behind, the obituaries. If you ever place an obituary for me, she says, don't put my age in it. Leave that out. <laughs> Even when you're dead, no one should know your age? <laughs> That's right. No one should know that, ever. No one needs to know that. Really? I always tell people how old you are. <laughs> what do you say? I say I'm having dinner with June. She's 52. You know? <laughs> no, don't say that. People say, what'd you do this weekend? I say, I went to the movies with my older girlfriend. <laughs> don't ever say that. If someone asks, they don't ask. I volunteer. <laughs> I know you do. From now on, you say, I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> She's in her early 50s. That's all you have to say. From now on. From now until I die. <laughs> Got it. She was born in the early 50s. <laughs> no. I'm not sure exactly. I know she was born in the 50s, the early 50s. I'm going to hurt you. In your sleep, I'll hurt you. I'll shave off all your hair. Don't you worry. She was born sometime back in the early 50s. Your eyebrows, how'd you like that?
We walk on the sand as the waves dump themselves on the beach and pull back, overturning shingle. Staring at the ocean puts you back in touch with your death wish, that yearning for infinity. It satisfies your need to disintegrate, become indefinite, merge. We watch a sandpiper work the momentary edge between surf and sand. It flees the incoming foam and chases the outgoing shine. This is its anxious beat. It works the continually disappearing zone of reflection in the sand, the forever vanishing now. <clears throat> we just smoked some hash. Station to station came on. Gradually it came on. You know, the steam, the midnight platform. We became very involved with the train sound at the beginning. It went on forever. Like from Berlin to Munich, it went on. <laughs> and then the guitar, wailing. How great is that, I said. Wow. See? See what? <laughs> Have you heard this? It's David Bowie, the Thin White Duke. That cracked me up, because I knew it wasn't her thing. Because she could pull this silly phrase from 40 years deep storage, even though she didn't care about Bowie. There was something about our age or parallel history. I said, what's not to like about this? I never understood David Bowie. It's like science fiction. I keeled over to one side, laughing. What's not to understand about this? Listen to the sound of that. That's all you got to know. But now Bowie came on, intoning, doing his creepy vampire cokehead Nazi bit. <laughs> I want to know what's going on, Michael. I want to know what's happening. I was doubled over. I couldn't breathe. She meant, what does he want? You know, what's he want from me? She's unimpressed by pretension. She wants music to be unequivocal. She wants music that wants her. I fell through a wormhole of adoration and laughter. <clears throat> I had a revelation. There was nowhere else I wanted to be, including alone. June was where I wanted to be, with June. This registered like the sound of a gong. I never suspected this was a possibility in a relationship. Always in the past, whoever I was with, I secretly wished to be elsewhere. <laughs> Even if it was off by myself, typing or drinking or whatever, I just thought this, this is how it is. Who knew it could be this way? We'd been there for another hour when the phone rang. It was her mother. When she hung up, our attention went back to the music. Half an hour later, she said, my mother had a comment for everything. Then she asked me what we were doing, and I said, listening to records. Nothing, total silence. She had nothing to say to that. Probably thought, how crazy is that? <laughs> We're burning the coffee table, I said. Our laughter increased. You should tell her something different every time she calls. She was waving me away, laughing. Us? We're taking the stuffing out of the pillows. <laughs> she kept waving to me to stop. We're turning the vases over. <laughs> As I walked up Driggs, Maggie May was coming out of a car at a light. Right away, I was back in the world of that song, the everlasting September. As I walked by, the mandolin player took his, F took his extra half measure. The very moment when summer ends, that last of it after Labor Day. As I crossed between cars, I could hear him hanging on. He held this glistening moment captive in that repeated phrase. And only after the band came back in did he start changing it up, still trying to elaborate that state of mind to tell the last of it before he let go and time moved on. Up over Driggs Avenue, a flight of pigeons flashed and turned. Saturday afternoon, cleaning house, Van Morrison playing. She went to see her friend Mo in Queens so she's coming from the J. I keep looking out the window. 
quiet out there for a change. There's no one but the usual crew by the bodega. One time a guy from Ohio staying with me, Mark, his first trip to New York, he woke up on the first morning, went down to smoke a cigarette on the step. The young guys across the street, dealers, were watching him and talking amongst themselves. It was them and him, 6.30 in the morning. Finally, they sent somebody across. The kid said, what are you doing here? Mark said, I'm staying with someone. The kid said, in this building? What's his name? Mike. The kid thought about it. He said, short white guy with his hair pushed back? <laughs> yeah. OK. What the hell? It's their neighborhood. I just moved into it, same as I did in the 80s. When I moved back here from San Francisco, I was looking for a place. My friend gave me three realtors. He said, go to this first one because they're Polish. Maybe you find something in Greenpoint. Go to this other one because they're really great. I dealt with them before. And go to this other one because they're Italian. <laughs> so I went to the first two, struck out, walk into the last place. There's a guy in a track suit reading the form. What can I do for you? I said, I'm looking for a place in the neighborhood, but I can only spend $1,000. Looks me up and down, says, all right, fill this out. Hands me a clipboard with an application. It must be four pages long. All this information they're asking for. And now he's behind me, like he's looking out the window. I write, Mike DiCapiti. He says, hey, you don't have to go crazy filling that whole thing out. <laughs> and he says, now, when can you move? I said, no rush, I can stay where I'm at for a month or two. He says, no, when can you move? When can you move? I said, I can move tomorrow. He says, OK, I'll pick you up 9 o'clock. I'll show you a place on the south side in a building with an elevator. Won't be no garbage. I walked out of there thinking, ah, oh, fuck, why'd I ever get involved with this guy? Now there's, there's no elevators in Williamsburg. Who knows what the hell he means by the south side? Could be Sheep's Head Bay. Next morning, 9 o'clock, phone rings, says, you ready? I said, listen, I told you I can only spend 1000 a month. He says, it's 957. OK. He says, you're Italian, right? I said, yeah. He says, me too. We never believe anything, even when it drops in our lap. <laughs> I'm still the only white guy in the building. Everyone else is Dominican. The other side of this door, the hall, smells like hot vinegar like it does every Saturday. In here, I've got eight lamb chops seasoned with garlic and dill on a broiler pan, a pot of kale with garlic and oil, and another of lima beans and tomato sauce. And I'm waiting for June to get off the J. Above the rooftops, the sky is bulging white like a gray balloon. Going over the Williamsburg Bridge on the J with the Xing and cross-hatching of girders and supports, the sky is orange, and the river's mirror blue, and you know there'll be another winter. 4 a.m., I can see red exit signs on three dark floors of a building about a block east and a couple of blocks north. Lying awake in the dark, a nerve in the night, feeling that we're mortal and vulnerable, and there's not much standing between us and old age. A siren goes by in that bath of night that isn't really dark, where the room and what's in it are a pointillation of gray and orange and lilac. And even the black windows in the wall outside look like you're seeing them through snow. That familiar non-color of night in every city, all your life, a darkness that doesn't hide you. There's no safety in the dark. There isn't even much darkness in it. Two fifteen in the morning, I'm awake. Warily, she reaches across and lays a finger on my right eye. <laughs> the hell are you doing? <laughs> trying to see if you're awake. <laughs> this is how you check to see if a person's awake? You stick a finger in their eye? Next time, just ask. Why are you awake? I don't know. Why are you awake? What are you thinking about? Nothing. You're worried about something. No. 
tell me. Actually, I was just thinking about all those old Italian places I've been to in the boroughs. How many did you come up with? Oh, I don't know, I wasn't counting. Do you want to list them? She says, turning over and putting her head on my chest. No, that's okay. Go ahead, honey, she says, settling in. What are they? Well, Dominic's, of course, and Roberto's in the Bronx on Arthur Avenue, and another place up there, F and J Pine. In Brooklyn, there's Bomanti's and the Frost Restaurant in Williamsburg, Queen out Court Street, and Sam's farther out on Court, Ferdinando's in Red Hook, Monty's in Gowanus, Two Toms in Park Slope, Michael's in Midwood, there's Randazzo's in Sheepshead Bay. She's breathing more heavily now. <laughs> Joe's of Avenue U in Gravesend, and Ellen B. Spumoni Garden around the corner, New Corner in Bay Ridge, Il Coliseo, and Ortobello's in Bensonhurst, Gargiulo's in Coney Island. She's fast asleep. <laughs> In Queens, I went on, idiotically. <laughs> There's Mondacati's in Long Island City and Piccolo Venezia in Astoria. The Parkside in Corona is a good one. Lenny's Clam Bar and Bruno in Howard Beach. Don Pepe in Ozone Park. Okay, last one. I woke to the sound of a shovel scraping the sidewalk below. Last night, I walked her to the subway in a blizzard, which was also the year's first snowfall. Snow swirl, it snowed upward, went spiraling down the side streets, broadsided you at the intersections. Someone was laughing, but you couldn't look up. Then she was laughing, standing in a drift. She had a certain pure laugh that sounded like life to me. She'd stop walking and just let it go like we were standing in a rowboat that was going down in three feet of water, and it was the funniest thing ever. She was able to laugh at herself, and she did it naturally. There was no self-regard in it. And in that laughter, I heard all of life, why we live even though we suffer and even though we die, why it's still worth it. Headlights floated by. A tall young guy fell in step with us. He was holding the remains of an umbrella over his head. He looked like he'd walked out of a Roadrunner cartoon. He asked where we were going. When we crossed the road to drop off a movie, I said, you're on your own. We heard him through the snow looking for a new friend. He didn't seem to have seen snow before. She said, he must be from California. I missed her even with her at my side. She turned me inside out, or I turned myself inside out for her. I felt like my heart was on the outside beating. There was never enough of her. I could never get close enough, never possess her completely enough. As though there were some measure of completeness beyond complete, something beyond now, something in the realm of imagination, some essence. I, I felt as though maybe cannibalism was the answer. <laughs> to kill and eat her right there in the snow. She claimed to feel exactly the same, but these things are hard to know. I kissed her at the subway. She was just a nose and a smile encircled by a snowy hood. I told her to hold the rail and watched her down. The walk home was desolate. Outside my hood was near silence except for the sound of a plastic tarp on a motorcycle snapping in the wind. By the time I made it to my building, my coat and scarf were white. I waited for the elevator with the snow melting off me, missing her, something terrible. Inside my apartment, I locked the door as though protecting what remained of her presence there. The screens were clotted with snow and there were five inches of it on the outside sill. I hung my scarf and coat and gloves in the shower, dried my hair with a towel, and went to bed listening to the radiator, the room cast in orange snow light. And this morning, I lay there listening to that shovel scrape the sidewalk, and then silence. My heart was still on the outside, beating, waiting.
Thank you.